TrueBit Verified is a verified computing platform, as the name might uh, might indicate. Uh, so what verified computing does is it takes uh, these compute functions that you've built, much the same way you would build a, a serverless function, uh, that you might deploy you know, uh, on the edge or you might want to deploy anywhere, and it makes that function trustworthy by verifying the, uh, the code uh, that's executing, uh, verifying the data that goes into the function, and verifying the outputs uh, of, of that code. Hi, this is your host, Supin Bhartia, and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us Blaine Sims, head of product at Truebit. Blaine, it's great to have you on the show. Hi, Swap. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's my pleasure to host you here today. And uh, this is the first time I'm talking to someone from the company. So I would love to know a bit about the history, the history of the company. How old is the company? What problem that you folks are trying to solve for the market? Absolutely. Uh, Truebit uh, traces its origins back to 2015. Uh, we started as a research project. Uh, our founder, uh, Dr. Jason Teutsch, uh, is uh, a, a researcher in computer science and game theory. So some of the work that he's done has been really important uh, in the world of Web3 uh, to uh, contribute to the question of how do you make blockchain scale? How do you perform uh, compute in Web3 that may not happen on a blockchain directly and make that compute secure? When you look at blockchain, how you have seen the evolution of blockchain and how your industry is leveraging these technologies? You know, blockchain, I think uh, when it, you know, when blockchain started hit, you know, hitting the scene uh, again around that, that, that uh, 2015 timeline, for example, was when the Ethereum blockchain uh, still very, very new. Uh, you know, uh, on, on the scene, really a lot of excitement uh, uh, because it seemed truly as a disruptive technology. Uh, the, you know, the, the reason that blockchains were created uh, was to facilitate transactions uh, between uh, parties that had absolutely no basis to know each other or to trust each other. Um, and while, you know, that uh, in, in many contexts is equated with cryptocurrency and, and indeed, you know, a lot of blockchain uh, technology originates in the, in the world of cryptocurrency. I think what's uh, really caught fire uh, since then is this notion that there are all sorts of different types of uh, interactions we have, transactions we have, whether as individuals or as businesses, uh, where uh, our assumption of trust uh, is really uh, one that gets uh, you know harder and harder to understand. Uh, you know that basis for trust uh, as we uh, you know as our you know, our, our world becomes increasingly digital, uh, our transactions become, you know, natively digital. Uh, how do we actually, uh, you know, keep good records, which is where blockchains come in, but also, uh, you know, create very highly automated and trustworthy, uh, you know, compute based processes around those transactions, which is where Truebit comes in. Can you also talk about of course, in this space, new technologies, new paradigm shift, new jargons keep coming up. We talk about chat GPT a lot of uh, a lot these days, generative AI. Uh, earlier, we were talking a lot about Web3, and there are a lot of misconceptions about Web3 as well. Talk about what are some of the emerging technologies that are of your interest for your industry, for your space. The blockchain industry itself, right, or the Web3 industry more broadly, which includes blockchains, but is broader than blockchains. Um, obviously is a, has been a hot topic uh, in itself. But I think what, what we're really interested in is now the convergence between this concept of decentralized trust and new technologies like generative AI. Um, where we see this convergence taking place is uh, primarily, you know, think, think of the world of the enterprise, right? That's going to increasingly be, uh, you know, building critical core business processes on top of AI technology that they have no control over. Uh, there's really only a handful of companies that have the compute resources that can even, you know, procure those resources to begin with, that have the, uh, you know, the models trained, that have the, uh, the expertise to build and run these models. Uh, so that, you know, kind of relatively small group of, uh, you know, of AI providers needs to be trusted by a huge group of enterprises uh, and what's the, you know, what's the ability to, uh, to trust? How do you know that the data uh, that's being fed into a model that might be specific to your business, how do you know that that data uh, was actually used in the model? How do you know that, uh, 
um, the uh, the requests you're making of that model uh, are uh, being processed accurately, and uh, and the results you're being provided back that you have uh, you know proof. Uh, you know, a chain of custody, if you will, for that entire transaction, uh, particularly if you're in a regulated industry. So this emergence of generative AI, uh, which is, you know, again, going to be outsourced uh, by most uh, most organizations to, to other partners, has a lot of different components, if you think of it as a supply chain in its own line, a lot of different components of data being supplied and compute being supplied. Uh, that intersects well with what we've been working on in the Web3 world, which is how to build trust uh, amongst different parties that really don't otherwise have a basis to trust each other. When we look at, once again, modern infrastructure environments, workloads, uh, I mean, de depends on what somebody is doing. Of course, we talk a lot about cloud. We talk about a lot of, you know, uh, technologies that are underneath, but we don't talk much about the computer itself. So talk a bit about what kind of technology you're seeing uh, when it comes to kind of once again, emergence, evolution of the whole compute. In, and we can also look at from the Web3 perspective. I think in, um, you know, in cloud-based compute, um, what, you know, what we're seeing uh, really top of mind with the developers that we talk to are a couple of, uh, you know, really, I think, key trends that, you know, depending on where, you know, where you sit, you might, you know, be skeptical of them, or you might really, really be embracing. The first trend in, in cloud-based compute is serverless compute. Um, serverless compute, right, is this notion that uh, you can uh, you know, reduce your code down, abstract it down to kind of its most atomic function level, uh, and then deploy that code as a function on someone else's server. Uh, typically, you know, these are servers within the large cloud computing uh, companies that we all know. Um, but then there's an extension of serverless compute that's equally interesting that's going on, uh, which I think some might say is, you know, is it an evolution beyond cloud-based compute? And that's edge-based compute, which takes this notion of serverless compute and extends it even further and says, well, maybe you don't need these function codes to run inside, a, you know, an Amazon or a Microsoft cloud. Maybe this function code can run on, at, on edge servers at the very, very closest point uh, of contact with, uh, you know, with the, uh, uh, the consumer that's using those compute services. These two trends, which I think are interrelated, um, really tee up uh, the you know the compute world for what we think is an evolution completely beyond cloud compute, which is an evolution to decentralized compute. So once you've made your code compact enough and small enough that it can run anywhere on anyone's server, and once you've deployed that code uh, in many many different places uh, so that it runs cl as close as possible to uh, you know to the client that's going to uh, you know consume the the output of that code. Uh, the next question is how can I get that code not to just run on you know, Amazon or Microsoft or maybe, you know, CloudFront or Fastly's Edge, how can I truly get that code to run anywhere? And when I, once I want to do that, once I want to say there literally could be, you know, not just tens of thousands of Edge points of presence, but millions of them, that's when we get to this question of how do you secure that? How do you make that code trustworthy? And we think from the, the security and compute side alone, that evolution uh, is what takes us into this questions of decentralized compute that Web3 is solving. And then we talked a minute ago about the, the business evolution that's taking place about needing to really more and more trust someone else to write key code that's running your business. Those two things we see kind of merging together uh, to be the perfect storm for Web3. When we do look at all the adoption of Web3 technologies, what kind of major challenges that developers face and how you folks kind of help them tackle with some of those challenges where we can also yeah, talk about the, the new announcement that you folks are coming out with. So it's a great time to talk about TrueBit Verify. So TrueBit Verify uh, is a brand new platform uh, that, uh, that we're announcing now. Uh, TrueBit Verified is a verified computing platform, as the name might, uh, might indicate. Uh, so what verified computing does is it takes... Uh, these compute functions that you've built, much the same way you would build a, a serverless function uh, that you might deploy, you know, uh, on the edge or you might want to deploy anywhere. And it makes that function trustworthy by verifying the, uh, the code uh, that's executing, uh, verifying the data 
that goes into the function and verifying the outputs uh, of, of that code. So what we do in TrueBit Verify is have a platform that manages that verification process, manages the, you know, the mechanics of here's some code that's served up anywhere really in, uh, you know, on the internet, if you will. Uh, but here's verification that's going on. We're gonna have multiple uh, compute nodes run the code uh, to see if they agree. If they don't agree, uh, underneath the hood, we do low-level verification. This is Jason uh, Twitch's big invention, right? Something called the, the verification game, which is using game theory to incentivize uh, the people that are running the code to uh, behave properly, but when they don't, to be able to point the finger and say, okay, I've gone down uh, to the machine code level and I can prove step-by-step step who's right and who's wrong when this code is executing. And then I can come back if someone has a disagreeing result and say, okay, I know this, this node was right, this node was wrong. And as a result of all that, I can bundle up all of those results, provide you back with the correct answer as the person that's running that code, and also do something really important, which is give you proof. I give you a certificate that says your code was run correctly. These were the inputs. These were the outputs. And that certificate is what allows you then to convey trust to whoever is uh, dependent on your code and your data. Can you also talk a bit about the benefits of kind of, you know, decentralization for developer? Uh, of course, when we look at decentralization, you know, we can look at it from a different perspective, decentralized workload, decentralized environments, decentralized architects. Uh, what, what, what kind of decentralization you are looking at and what kind of benefit you see there are for developers? What we find is the number one reason developers move into Web3 and move towards decentralization centralization is they're looking for transparency. Uh, again, this transparency might be because uh, they are running transactions or have a, you know, a business uh, that in of itself, uh, you know, has no underlying basis for trust. So they need to be very, very transparent about the transactions that took place for that business and about any of the code, uh, which is where TrueBit Verify comes in, any of the code that contributes to those transactions, the, the API calls that you might need to uh, make to uh, you know, uh, an upstream service or to uh, move uh, data or, or, or move a transaction downstream, uh, the movement of data from one place to another, including across blockchains, uh, and then the uh, you know those backend uh, algorithms and AI models that really really impact how a, tra a transaction takes place. The transparency around that is uh, what brings uh, folks to Web three. What they find when they get to Web three though are some really important other things. Um, Web3 uh, decentralization uh, as, a, as an entire concept uh, is extraordinarily resilient to failure. There's literally not a single point of failure in a, in a widely uh, deployed uh, you know, blockchain or uh, verified compute network such as TrueBits building because there are generally tens of thousands, if not more, independent parties running that network. Um, and a lot of different, you know, ways to get around even network routing issues, things that, that you know, can even plague the largest and most, uh, you know, successful cloud companies. Um, and then the final point is efficiency. Um, again, uh, you know, this is one of the drivers perhaps for serverless, but it gets, you know, extended even further in the Web3 world. Uh, why pay to have your code hosted all the time, uh, particularly if it's something that is only occasionally being used, when it can be ready and waiting and just called on demand. So the efficiency uh, aspect brings uh, developers to Web3 as well. Um, and then obviously, you know, Web3 as a, you know, kind of as its own phenomenon has some, uh, you know, some interesting businesses that have emerged there like the metaverse, et cetera, that, uh, you know, have a lot of people really interested in that as well on the consumer side. So one of the things, um, you know, as we were building TrueBit Verify uh, that we did was really spend a lot of time talking to uh, you know, not just folks that are interested in blockchains, but folks that are actively building Web3 applications. And we define that as, you know, applications that that leverage, either directly leverage a blockchain ledger or le leverage decentralized uh, compute as part of their design. And what we found is that there, are, there actually are all sorts of really hard things that developers have to do in order to get an application up and running. And they have to make, you know, kind of a lot of compromises and, and take some shortcuts to do that. Um, and, and so that's what we really wanted to focus on when we were building TrueBit Verify is how to, uh, you know, to bring transparency into these areas starting, you know, within Web3 alone, where developers weren't able to actually, uh, you know, make their application as transparent as they wanted. They, maybe they uh, are using a blockchain and the code that they're writing uh, is too complicated or too expensive to run on a blockchain. TrueBit Verify allows them to run that code. Uh, 
transparently and then have that certified proof that they can then attach to the blockchain. Talked about API calls before. The other thing that we that we really found is um, you know, the the way that uh, that Web3 developers are told that they should be securing their code is by writing these really complicated things called smart contracts. Trubit Verify allows you to write um, your code in JavaScript or in Rust, in these languages you're most likely used to working with uh, on your own, uh, you know, and, and tries to, you know, help you simplify this process of getting transparency into your code. And that's where I want to head next, which is uh, just from Trubit's perspective, what kind of use cases are there? Of course, you can or cannot name some of the companies who are that are leveraging your technologies. Uh, if not, then just give us a glimpse of the use cases that you know you folks kind of cater to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Tribit Verify, uh, you know, announcing this uh, this product, uh, you know, our first live uh, use case. Uh, will be coming online, uh, you know, towards the end of this year, uh, which is a supply chain based use case. Uh, so there's a supply chain consortium uh, in Europe uh, that's uh, built around the luxury goods industry. Um, this industry is one of the first industries to actually adopt blockchain technologies. You mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Hyperledger as a technology that's, uh, uh, you know, that's been around for a while uh, on the enterprise side of blockchain. Uh, it's one of the, uh, uh, you know, the the ledgers that's being used uh, in this project. Uh, but there are other ledgers as well. And so what, uh, you know, what uh, this project needed was a way to move data securely from one ledger to another. And TrueBit Verify provides that. We provide an auditable uh uh, you know, kind of certificate uh, that allows, uh, you know, this, any of the, the uh, participants in this consortium to see uh, data that may have originated on uh, on Hyperledger uh, move to any of the other blockchains uh, that are part of the consortium project. So that's, that's one use case. Um, we've got, uh, you know, other uh, kind of earlier stage projects uh, in, um, you know, in the entertainment industry where we're working with a group of major recording artists who aren't trying to, you know, completely change the way the industry operates at this point, but they are trying to um, make the uh, the royalties uh, that they distribute uh, for their songs uh, much more transparent, uh, so that all of the uh, all of the uh, you know the parties that they work with that are owed part of those royalties uh, can see uh, exactly how uh, you know what money came in and how it was split up and have an auditable record of getting paid. Uh, that project's uh, you know working with us to to do all of those calculations to show the calculations have that proof of, uh, of compute uh, to show the source of the data, uh, to prove that the data wasn't changed uh, when they receive it uh, from, from API calls that they make, and then to show proof of payment that when they uh, finished the calculations and made calls to their payment APIs, those calls are also recorded with a transcript and, uh, and all of that is, uh, you know, is available for, uh, for inspection. I want to hear from you a journal high-level overview of market industry, not specific to your industry, where the technical trends are heading. And then you see, hey, you know what? These are some of the things that creates a lot of opportunity for us. At the same time, these are the challenging areas that we are looking at addressing. We, we talked about serverless and edge compute before. Um, obviously, Web3 as well. Uh, you know, this, I, I think uh, at, at the moment, uh, I think a lot of uh, a lot of us are, um, you know, fixated on the changes uh, that are uh, that are coming with the shift to generative AI. I mean, the, um, you know, top to bottom, uh, you know, if you haven't contemplated how generative AI might change your job, uh, you know, you've probably been busy, very, very busy doing something else because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very top of mind. So in the world of generative AI, uh, you know, the challenges when you... Uh, when you set aside maybe you know surface concerns that the code will write itself and will you know none of us developers will be uh, coding. I think nobody's truly hopefully worried about that. Um, what what we do see underneath underneath that hood though is this ability to scale up, the ability to do so much more um, with uh, you know with the help of AI um, that it puts a lot of pressure on uh you know on our supporting processes on our processes like security um you know a lot of organizations uh spend uh, an inordinate amount of time rightfully so vetting any piece of code that they're going to bring in or any library that they're going to bring in or any partnership that they're going to establish uh around the the compute that's going on with the organization for security reasons um the uh you know the you think under the <clears throat> under the hood, these you know security checklists and, and compliance procedures, uh, really in many cases, yes, they're somewhat automated to around the edges, but they're very very manual processes. How does those processes scale? How do you uh, 
you know, how do you know, uh, you know, whether whether it's AI that that's written your code or AI written the, that's written somebody else's code or a model that you're, um, you know, that you're going to be calling into, how do you know that that's secure? Um, and how do you, you know, how do you do that when that's, uh, you know, that that code's being generated at, uh, you know, you know, maybe a thousand times the pace is what we're seeing right now as uh, some of the, the AI really hits stride. Um, the second challenge within within AI then is uh, the data. Uh, there's well documented cases of garbage in, garbage out uh, in terms of the you know the data that's fed into models, um, you know, just being regurgitated back and being very inaccurate. Um, you know, maybe in some of the uh, you know the use cases we see for ChatGPT as consumers, where we're just having ChatGPT write a letter for us or something along those lines. It's not a big deal because we can see those um, you know those inaccuracies. But as you see AI being really uh, you know used in industries like uh, you know medical science, where AI is doing diagnoses, or uh, where AI is being used to make critical financial decisions, uh, that question of is the data good uh, is another area where trust becomes very very important. Do you do you see where the data came from? Uh, do you see how it was applied? Et cetera. So there's just a couple of things, you know, kind of relative to that trend that, that uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about. Blaine, thank you so much for taking time out today and uh, share, you know, these great insight uh, the announcement of the new product now. So this whole market, where it's heading, what challenges there are for developers and how you folks are helping solve them. Thanks for all those insights. And I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swap. Really been uh, a great, uh, great conversation. Thank you.